Welcome everyone to this discussion on um, high performance data analytics uh, with Dr. Bader. Dr. Bader is a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science and director of the Institute of Data Science at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Prior to this, he served as founding professor and chair of the School of Computational Science and Engineering and College of Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He's a fellow of the IEEE, AAAS, and SIAM, as well as advises the White House, most recently on National Strategic Computing Initiative. Well, welcome, Dr. Uh, Bader. We're very, very excited to have you here today and excited to hear more about high-performance data analytics. Thank you, Mechi, so much for inviting me here to speak today at Data Yap. And I encourage those in the audience to ask questions you can put them in the chat and I'll either look at them while I'm speaking or after I'm done speaking or use the Hoover app as well to ask your questions. I'd love to have a, a dialogue with you. And as Mechi mentioned, I'm talking today about high performance data analytics and especially ways to use data analytics to solve really important global grand challenges. So let me get into my talk and as Mechi mentioned, I'm at the New Jersey Institute of Technology that I recently joined. And the school is moving up. It's now an R1 research school in Newark, New Jersey. And it's known for upward mobility. About um, over a third of the students are the first generation and their families going to college. And we have a great track record being ranked number one by the New York Times for moving students from the bottom fifth of the income scale to the top three fifths. So it's a very rugged school. And I joined in July, 2019 to direct a new Institute for Data Science that has a number of centers associated with it. We have a center for big data that looks at big data analytics systems and tools and cyber infrastructure, a cybersecurity research center focused on practical encryption and homomorphic encryption and other privacy technologies. And we have a medical informatics center that focuses on biomedical ontologies, working with the NIH and the National Cancer Institute. And we recently started a FinTech group. We're really at the heart of the FinTech sector and the insurance in industry, working between New York City, Jersey City, and Newark we have quite a big representation of companies. And this is a very productive group. And this semester, we're launching a brand new center focused on machine learning and AI. And also, I want to mention we run a seminar series for data science every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. The uh, link is in the slides. But we also share those talks on YouTube. So if you check out NGIT Institute for Data Science on YouTube, you'll find all of the talks that we've had so far this year. I mentioned NGIT being in, in Newark, but we have a brand new satellite location in Jersey City where we offer a lot of education for students who are returning to school in the uh, lower Manhattan and New Jersey region. And it's really been a great uh, attraction for students looking for more training in statistical inference, machine learning, data viz, data mining, and big data. And if you want a better view of it, this is what it looks like today, uh, looking at Lower Manhattan. We're in a building that is um, just to the right center of the screen that is located near the Exchange Place Path Station. And we share it with the Bank of America. Um, we're on the 36th floor. And just a, a few uh, blocks down on uh, Hudson Street is Goldman Sachs, and going the other way is JP Morgan Chase. So it's a, a great area and just one stop from the financial sector, the financial district of Lower Manhattan. So as I mentioned at the start of this talk, I really want to talk about solving global grand challenges. And those are places or problems that we really need to solve and that we want to use data science to do so. And it ranges from problems in urban sustainability. For instance, how do we keep developing cities and letting them grow 
while reducing congestion, having better quality of life, um, air quality, and all the things that go along with having a vibrant city. Healthcare analytics is very important as we move towards electronic uh, patient records. And even now during the COVID pandemic, it would be very nice to understand more quickly our personal medicine, our personal health, and also how populations uh, fare health-wise. Trustworthy, free and fair elections, we've heard a lot about in the last several years that we want to know and have trust in the in the outcomes of elections, finding insider threats within large organizations, protecting our utility and infrastructure, for instance, making sure that our power grid doesn't go down at um, any time, including critical times like giving this talk. We'd like to make sure that the power stays up, that our network stays up, and so on. Uh, cyber attack and giving attribution to particular attacks all the way through disease outbreak and epidemic modeling that we read so much about today with the COVID pandemic. These are the types of real world challenges that really um, make us seek out data and apply it to problems that affect our human lives to make our, our lives safer, better, more enjoyable. And that's what I'm here to talk with you today about. I also wanna mention some uh, sponsors that we've had. The National Science Foundation recently gave us an award to look at interactive data science at scale. And what that means is that often we have data sets that may sit in our laptops, maybe they're tens of gigabytes in size, and we can use tools like Python's NumPy to pick up these data sets, to explore them, manipulate them, visualize, visualize them. But when those data sets start to become large, when they become, say, tens of terabytes, we no longer can fit them in our laptops or to manipulate those data sets may take much too long. So we're working with um, a software framework called Arcuda that's developed by Mike Merrill and Bill Royce at the Department of Defense. It's an open software product and it has a Python front end and it can use a specialized compiler called Chapel on the back end that could either run on a multi-core compute node or could run on a big supercomputer if you have it. And we can use this Arcuda framework to have the ability to manipulate these massive data sets just as easily as you can use NumPy within your Jupyter notebook. So this is work that's actively being developed. And we're also looking to collaborate with other folks who may want to try out this technology. It was recently uh, described in this press release from NGIT, and it really talks about democratizing supercomputing. What we want to do is bring equity so that everyone, including citizen scientists, are able to get the power of big data at their hands and to be able to do it, even if they don't have a computer, a supercomputer like I do next to you, that you'll be able to work on these massive data sets. So that's the vision that we have. We've come a, a long way. In fact, I've helped set the roadmap for systems, large scale systems for data science in the United States. Back in 2015, I was part of the planning for the National Strategic Computing Initiative that was launched by President Obama at the time that really set out a strategy for the nation to deploy advanced computing making note that data science was of growing importance. And many reports have come out since that speak to the value of being able to, to manage and understand the information in big data. So I have a couple of quotes up, up on the slide here, but one talks about the healthcare sector alone providing so much value by being able to get at the details within these big data sets. Now that NSCI, National Strategic Computing Initiative was updated in the previous White House administration. And again, I, I was a part of that. And in December, sorry, in November, 2019, a new report came out that updated the nation's plan. And here the, the chief technology officer of the US 
at the time, Michael Kratzios retweeted me. So I feel like this was my 15 or maybe just five minutes of, of fame of being tweeted by the, the previous um, White House administration. This plan laid out a, a 10 year goal of looking at how to create partnerships between industry, government, and academia to really create those software systems and the computer architectures needed to address high performance data analytics. Now, in the last year or two, we've had some more progress and it's been called the Future of Advanced Computing Ecosystem or FACE. And I've been pleased to work with the White House's um, Office of Science and Technology Policy and two meetings that have been held that are really laying the framework for how the US is going to continue to revolutionize what we're doing with large scale big data analytics. So um, in addition to the work with the government, I also work very closely with industry that helps inform my views in data science, but also we have been developing some great things. Recently, we've worked with NVIDIA and I run an AI lab or an NVAIL award for building out graph analytics within their open source data science toolkit called Rapids AI. And this uh, is work now going on two years. In fact, a few days ago, NVIDIA held their um, GTC, their developers conference that talked about the new work that they have within Rapids for doing data science at scale. We're in such an exciting time that we have hardware acceleration to do this type of data science and that we can develop on our systems. But when we need extra horsepower because our data sets are too large or because they're coming at us like a fire hose, we can turn to these types of systems to get the analytics running faster. We've also worked with Facebook and their AI systems for representation learning problems that are very important for the quality of service that you have when you are using a big enterprise system like Facebook. And so we've helped to develop some machine learning techniques that really go towards scalable learning with massive data sets. So let me get into the heart of my, my talk today. And I'd like to describe data science on these axes that generate four quadrants. On the x-axis, I wanna talk about objects from known objects on the left to unknown objects on the right. And on the y-axis, I have patterns from unknown, sorry, from known patterns at the bottom all the way to unknown patterns at the top. So this is what data is uh, containing or telling us. And I can go through these quadrants one by one. On the lower left, where we have known objects and known patterns, we had database technologies in the 1980s, for instance, relational databases that were easy to use and really match this quadrant of our data space. For instance, we may have a store and that store has products. We have customers. Every time they check out, we have a list of items that are in their shopping cart. And this type of uh, data fits in easy to describe schema. And we can ask queries such as tell me which customers bought this product or which products are consistently purchased together or what products do we need to reorder. And th this was um, really great until we found that we had a lot of questions that didn't quite match this, um, this methodology. So in the 1990s, we had vertical databases and they helped us with problems such as what I have in this upper left-hand quadrant where we may have known objects, but unknown patterns. For instance, here I, I pulled out an example from cybersecurity. Imagine you're the chief security officer and one of your employees keeps tripping security flags and you're wondering what are they up to? Who are they talking to? What files are they trying to access? Are they uh, collaborating with anyone? What's going on? And so here I have a known object, for instance, the employee that is raising these flags, 
but an unknown pattern where I want to look around and see what they're doing. Or in the lower right hand quadrant, where I have unknown objects but known patterns, this is a problem of subgraph isomorphism. Here I have a little template, it's a pattern, and I have in, in this template, there's two people, they live together, they're watching a business, one rents a truck, one is buying fertilizer, and that may be a, a pattern that is um, a security threat. And what I wanna do is look at observed activity to see is there any form of this pattern. Maybe it's not exact, maybe there's edges missing or there's um, three people living at the house, but I wanna look and see, do I see anything that looks like this? And then I can investigate further. So these types of problems we know how to solve fairly well, but what really intrigues me is this fourth quadrant of unknown unknowns. And this is the exciting quadrant that gives us surprises. We want to be able to minimize those surprises, but understand what's in there. How do I look at that quadrant? Also, machine learning technologies tend not to help us because I have to train a machine learning model with examples. And if I don't know what's in this quadrant, I can't train it. I can't recognize for those examples. So this is really the space that, that we work in. And we've been surprised by many things. For instance, we were surprised that COVID-19 became a pandemic. We've been surprised that there was an attack on the US Capitol on January 6th. We were surprised by many things because we hadn't seen it before. And this is really the power of looking at this quadrant. Now, I tend to see everything as a graph. I love Kirk Bourne's keynote talk this morning at Data Yap, where he talked about graphs really representing everything that we do. Knowledge is typically these relationships that we build up. So I focus on graph data science for these real world challenges. For instance, in healthcare, we may want to understand the spread of disease, how to detect new epidemics and pandemics. In mass massive social networks, we may want to understand communities. How do they form? What are their intentions? How does um, a pandemic spread within a community? Is there disinformation in our social networks? How do transportation systems work? How would you evacuate if there was a storm coming? And this all really is important problems that we, that we must solve. In intelligence, there's a lot of questions about business analytics and understanding the margins within companies. In systems biology, we may be interested in understanding life itself. I mentioned the electric power grid earlier and power is so important to communicate, to have transportation systems for our energy, even our water and food supply. So we wanna make sure that the power grids are resilient to attack from um, internal and external sources. And then all the way up to modeling and simulation are predicting full-scale economic, social, political simulations of entire nations. For instance, we see today placing sanctions on Russia and other types of, of um, interactions between countries. We want to understand what type of effect that may have towards our safety here. So all of these require predicting or influencing change in real time and at scale. So these are really, really exciting problems. Now I mentioned graphs are used often and there isn't one type of graph. There's many, many types of graphs. On this slide, I've given you just a couple so you get a, a feel for it. On the left, I have a digital sky survey image that we see in astrophysics. And often we may be looking at something like trying to find a quasar, which is a, a, pulsing, um, a, a pulsing body out in the sky. So what we may do is take two images and do outlier detection, trying to find changes between those two images. But often we have a lot of challenges. For instance, these are massive data sets. In fact, some of the biggest data sets that exist are these sky surveys. There may be temporal variations in the data. And then I have to figure out what is my graph problem. And that may be clustering or 
matching these points between images. And once I find that outlier, what I'll want to do in minutes is turn my radio telescope towards that event because I only have a limited time to observe it with my scientific instrument. In the middle is an example of a graph from bioinformatics where maybe I'm trying to identify drug target proteins and I'm taking a lot of data from different uh, medical labs and there's all sorts of quality issues. There's heterogeneity in the data and what was collected. And maybe my graph problem is trying to find the most central proteins or clustering the proteins together. On the right-hand side, I have an example graph from a social network where I'm doing social informatics. Maybe I'm trying to figure out how communication works in these networks, modeling the spread of information or disinformation, and I want to look at who may be important within that, that spread. So in these cases, my challenges are that I may need new analytic routines in order to figure out what algorithms I need to run. There's also a lot of uncertainty in the data. It may be sampled. It may be missing a lot of safe friendship edges. And the type of graph problem that I'm trying to solve could look like clustering of the vertices together that's finding people and groups. I may be trying to find shortest paths or understand the flow of information through these networks. So these are just three samples of the types of graphs that we may find. Just to uh, give you some more data points, here's a network, a graph representing the US power grid. In fact, there's an east power grid and a west power grid. And as we learned recently in Texas, they have their own power grid separate from the others. And these outages are just catastrophic. People die when the power goes out. So it's important to be able to understand these networks and react in near real time to prevent and to mitigate these types of outages. I had shown one of these plots before, but network analysis is used in intelligence and surveillance. For instance, at the top, I give an example from September 11th, and this is a plot of passengers who are on, on planes. And it's been argued that if we could have used centrality, which is a graph analytic for finding the most central actors within these graphs, just from the topology of the graph, we could have correctly identified who were the masterminds of the hijacking of planes on September 11th. And on the bottom, this is also a public graph from communications of the ACM from a number of years ago that represented the Oklahoma City bombing. And what we're trying to compute is either graph matching, like this template we move around. It's also called subgraph isomorphism is the graph algorithm where maybe we're looking for an exact copy of this template or maybe a, an approximate matching of it. And this is useful not just in security, but these techniques are useful in biology or finding uh, motifs of patterns of different biological elements within cells as well. So they're very powerful techniques that we can use across a number of domains. I also mentioned public health. We were the first group to paralyze or speed up the graph analytic called between us centrality. I don't have time today to tell you all the details of the algorithm, but it tries to find vertices in a graph that are sitting on the largest percentage of shortest paths within the network. So removing them in some way most disconnects the network. So we pretended that the proteins within the human genome were like people on Facebook and that we had edges between proteins if they interacted with each other. So in some sense, we built the Facebook of human uh, proteins and we wanted to figure out were there proteins that were maybe not the ones with the largest number of friends, but were really sensitive towards disease. And what I've plotted here is just a, a cartoon of the, the output. The x-axis is in a log scale, the degree of each vertex. And to tell you what that means, that's just simply the number of friends each protein has. And then the y-axis is their score in a log scale of between a centrality, this metric that is looking at 
how important are they in the cell? And what we found was that the human protein that had the highest between a centrality score was implicated in breast cancer. So to note, this is like finding a needle in a haystack. The proteins that have the most number of friends are the ones on the far right edge uh, of this graph. And when we're trying to look for important proteins, we're looking from the top down, we're able to find these needles that in this haystack of, of proteins are ones that we should really observe more because they're critical to how the cells operate. So th this is interesting, and I won't go through all of this slide, but anytime we get a problem in data science related to graphs, we have to step through sort of this flowchart of understanding the, um, the problem that we're trying to solve. For instance, are we looking for paths or clusters are we trying to partition the data apart, match information together, find patterns or orderings? And from that, we'll want to look at what type of graph do we have? For instance, is it a very sparse graph or is it a very dense graph? Is it changing over time? Do edges have weights or values? Do vertices have weights? And if they have weights, do they come from a random distribution? Are they um, skewed in some way. And we'll take all of these different features and then choose what's the right algorithm and then what's the right framework for trying to solve that graph problem. So it really takes an expert who's able to understand the selection process of features of that graph that will influence the algorithms and then what system to implement it on to really get high performance for these graph problems. Now, I'd like to also think about data, not just as static data sets, but really data is always being generated. We're always receiving it. And what this slide is speaking to is that in the past, we looked at data sets as these static data sets. And many large computers, in fact, supercomputers as well, could load in these static data sets and could analyze them. For instance, if I was a company and I found out that someone hacked my company and intruded in my systems, I would want to gather up all my system logs and do the data science in order to figure out how did they get in. And after figuring out the how, figure out what did they touch, what did they take. Now that's really bad. That's an after the fact type of analysis. It's a forensic analysis that's essentially the same as reporting the news where I wanna to get to is the ability to predict and really have strategic advantage. I'd like to know this is coming and stop it before it ever happens. And that's what I think of as streaming analytics, where we're going to need new ways to think about data that is streaming and our view of the data is constantly changing. And we wanna be able to operate at high speed so that imagine we have a big data lake and we get new one new data item, we want to be able to update all of our assumptions without boiling the ocean or the lake, I should say, and really just in the time proportional to that one update. And so that's the type of research that we're working on. And once we start thinking about data that's streaming, we get to this graph data science space that has not been explored yet. For instance, how do we detect communities that are emerging? We know given a static graph, how to pick out clusters, but now once you tell me that this is changing over time, how do I find a brand new community? How do I figure out who are the important actors and do those actors um, change over time? Or how do I find an individual who is core in one community, but over some period of time, is now core in a different community? Or could I, I find an event that I, is an emerging event that I wouldn't have thought about before? So there's many, many problems that we can start to solve as we get to this large scale and as the data is streaming towards us. So in my view of doing high-performance data analytics, often I take the real problem. For instance, I'll just give the analogy from, from a social media network. 
like Facebook, and this person is going to be taking an action on another person. And I represent these as tuples. So here, person A is going to poke person B at time one. Here's person B over here. And maybe at time two, person A sends a private message to person C, but concurrently, person B receives that poke that person A did from the previous time period. And so all of these actions happen concurrently, and I could represent them as tuples. And every one of those tuples, I could represent as an edge in a graph. So the two first elements are the names of the vertices. There's a timestamp and then an action that would be on the edge connecting those two points. So I'll just turn these into edges and move into this graph abstraction. Once I have this graph abstraction, I could use a big computer and I could build that graph. And here's a cartoon of what that graph looks like. And here my vertices have different colors. Maybe they're in different communities, there are edges and so on. And what I have are these really smart analysts that want to ask questions of that data. So they may pose a question and inquire with that graph abstraction about their query. And maybe it's not just one question, but maybe they have multiple questions concurrently that are operating at the very same time we're ingesting this data into our big data framework. So that's the type of analysis that we have to do. And these are the types of systems that are just emerging. They're able to provide this type of capability. So let me just tell you a, a quick story. In 2009, I led the very first group that did a analysis of all of the public tweets in Twitter. So we were the very first cute group to be able to take the fire hose of tweets. And at the time we looked at September and October in 2009, when we ran this experiment and we put that fire hose into a supercomputer at the time. Here, it was the Cray XMT and running our system of software to do an analysis. And we used the followers and followees to create a graph that would change over time. And we used hashtags in order to understand breaking events. Now, this was quite different from any other work previously that really just did heat maps of the hashtags to figure out what was trending. We were using the graph structure to understand what was happening in Twitter space. And you know, at that time, we didn't even know you could become a president by tweeting. Um, we didn't even know if there's any value to tweets. Everyone was asking, what is Twitter? Is it um, just garbage or is there some, you know, is there some good that could come out of it? So we decided to take a look at two breaking events at the time. And I have to say it, it's, um, it, it's quite interesting. We looked at the outbreak of H1N1, which was the pandemic of two, 2009. We never thought we'd see another pandemic by the time I'm, I'm speaking to you today. And we also looked at the 500 year flood that happened in Atlanta. And I, I should say that's also not quite interesting because since this data came out, there's several more 500 year floods in Atlanta. I think there's been three or four in, in the last couple of years. So, um, so much for 500 year floods, it's now probably two year floods. But let me tell you a story about H1N1. So H1N1 was a highly infectious influenza virus. And at the time, it was uh, thought to have double digit mortality, quite serious as we see from the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic, that we really want to know what, what's happening and stop these pandemics early to save lives. So here we used Betwinna Centrality and we ranked the handles on Twitter that were the most influential meaning these were the handles that really influenced what people thought was happening with H1N1. And this is ad hoc. I pulled out the top 15 results here, and some make a lot of sense. For instance, numbers one, CDC flu, number four, flu.gov, number 
12 and 13 are CDC handles. This is what you'd expect, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention really providing useful information for what are the symptoms of this pandemic and how do we stay safe. There's also commercial media in here, as we'd expect. For instance, number five is the New York Times, number eight is CNN, number 11 is Time Magazine, and that's also good. That, that's what we'd expect where people get their information from. But to us, the real surprise was maybe number three, official PACs. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I had no idea what official PACs was, nor would I think about turning my dial into them when there's a breaking event. I, probably the last thing on, on, my, on my mind of who to listen to. So for those of you who don't know, I did a little bit of research and I found out that this was a group of mostly adolescent male gamers who were going to their annual conference in Seattle, Washington called the Penny Arcade. Would you have thought to listen to them about health and, and pandemics? Probably not. But it turned out that this group was very, very influential because they were the first group in the United States to contract H1N1. And they start to tweet about it with each other. Like, hey, what are the symptoms? You know, I have a fever, I have a runny nose. Um, did you go to the doctor? Yes, it was confirmed, I have H1N1. And then there are a lot of tweets like, did you die? No, I'm not dead. Did you die? No, I'm not dead either. And um, what happened eventually was that H1N1 was not as serious as we expected it to be, but it was really, it would be really useful to know before a breaking event or during a breaking event, how to quickly turn our dial into the most accurate news sources. And we've seen that again and again over time, that figuring out how to get good information during breaking events, which could be political unrest, during catastrophic weather, during emergencies is really important. Now, I also have to add to the story because on the slide, I have number nine, is the Backstreet Boys. And they're this boy band from a number of years ago. And I gave a talk in India and I had the slide up and it must have been the Backstreet Boys number one fan was in the audience. He asked me, how come they're up on the slide? I said, I, I don't know, um, I have no idea. So we went back to the data and it's always good to go back to your data and look at it. And this was a false positive. People were tweeting at this time, tweets that said, hey, I'm going to the store to buy the new Backstreet Boys album. Maybe it was a CD at the time because it was released. And did you see the news about H1N1? So there wasn't a direct relationship between the Backstreet Boys and H1N1, but they were heavily involved in the graph so it's always important when we get results in data science to go back and just validate and verify those results. Now, our lab has been developing software for quite a number of years called Sting or Stinger for Spatial Temporal Interaction Networks and Graphs. And it's very useful for holding and providing analytics for these types of graphs that are going to change over time or dynamic graphs as I've, I've called them. And again, we've been developing this for, um, at this point, many, many years, so over a decade or, or more. And we've been able to implement a number of algorithms, for instance, tracking components in a graph over time, being able to look at the structure of social networks over time, even computing the page rank, which was the core algorithm that Google used for ranking web pages on the internet, we were the first to figure out an incremental algorithm that could update the scores without having to boil the ocean to recompute the page rank for everything. We could do it for just increments. And then in the last several years, we've been working closely with accelerators like the NVIDIA GPU, developing new algorithms, but also the core um, algorithms, Stinger became Hornet, and then that was integrated into KuGraph in the Rapids AI framework, the open source framework for 
NVIDIA's data science platform. This is really the future of high-performance data analytics is being able to accelerate computing all of these rich characteristics in real time. So I, I won't go through a, a lot of the details of, of Stinger. It's a, a package that's been available. It's on GitHub as well, which has a lot of these algorithms for doing a streaming version of many important graph analytics like clustering coefficients that is looking for communities within a graph based on counting triangles for this between us centrality that I mentioned. But instead of a static value of who's important in the graph, it's able to keep track over time and also do other types of community detection. And we use these graphs because traditional SQL databases really don't have a good way of representing these types of graph queries. Also, graph databases are excellent if your data is on disk, but in some cases, your data on disk runs orders of magnitude slower than if you have your data in memory. So when we're working on, on important problems and global grand challenges where we need to respond in milliseconds or seconds, we need to pull that data into memory on our system. And that's really not the sweet spot for graph databases. Also, there's some great systems like Hadoop and HDFS-based projects, Spark and others, but it's not really the right abstraction or programming model to think about many of these structural queries over the entire graph. And also, if I just want to randomly access points in my data set, it becomes very expensive because in these systems, I often have to load everything from disk. There are some smaller graph libraries and processing tools but they typically work very well when my data sits on a single processor or node. But once I have a large data set, they become infeasible or just take too long to run. So just to conclude this talk, solving these massive scale analytics really requires new high-performance computing platforms and streaming algorithms. And that's what we're doing at the university is to develop these and then push these technologies out in the open source for other companies and industries to commercialize. And also, I didn't mention it as much in this talk, but energy efficiency is really key. We really have to develop algorithms for data science that reduce data movement, because that data movement is really what drives up our energy costs. For instance, we see the cost to use, say, Elasticsearch, or we see the cost to store data. We see the power bill of our system running data. And that energy has now become a first class design principle when we're trying to figure out how much data science can we do. It's not by the biggest computer that we can get. It's really by the budget that we have to pay for the electricity to run that system. And then mapping the applications to high performance architectures or big data systems could give you six or more orders of magnitude performance improvement. So it's important to take a look at your problem and then try to map it to the right system that is going to be able to solve your problem. And this, again, I can't emphasize enough, is really important for solving those global grand challenges ranging from urban sustainability healthcare, trustworthy free and fair elections, insider threats, our infrastructure problems, cyber defense and attribution, and again, disease outbreak and epidemic modeling. A number of folks have helped in the work that I presented today, including my research scientist, Dr. Ji Hua Du, my PhD student at NGIT, Oliver Alvarado Rodriguez, a former PhD student, Oded Green, now at NVIDIA, and then some of my alumni, Dr. Isha Nathan, she's at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Vipin Sashdeva, uh, Dr. Anita Zashkushka, who's currently at Trovaris, um, Dr. Louise Mungua, who's at Google, Professor Kamesh Midori at Penn State, Dr. David Ediger at GTRI, Professor James Fairbanks at the University of Florida, and Dr. Sung Hwa King, who is now at NVIDIA. So thank you again for your attention and I'd love to take any questions that you have.
Wow, thank you, Dr. Bader. That was very, very interesting. I really enjoyed that um, presentation. Uh, we have several questions. And before we get into it, I want to start with this to sort of wrap on, on the point you made about power being a critical factor in terms of computing. The society, the Semiconductor Industry Association, rather, uh, predicted, predicts that by 2040, we as a society will run out of power to support our computing devices. So that is gonna be a major, major aspect working forward. And that's one of the exciting things going on with quantum computing to sort of supersede that energy drain on, on computing. So that, that's a great observation. And you, you know, I used to go to meetings years ago where everyone would argue for big data, big data, big data, because it helps, for instance, Google with Google search. And I would stand up at those meetings and yell, small data, small data, small data. And what I really meant was that we want to figure out what is the power of the data that we need to solve our problems. I want the smallest data set that gives me the same ability to answer questions as a larger data set or understand what parts of my data sets are working for me in my analyses and what parts are really extraneous and I don't need to keep. And I think as we go forward, we're going to see a lot of research coming out in data reduction techniques. How do we take data sets and really reduce the data size? And energy is really going to be dictated by moving data, not the compute part. The compute part actually is very little energy, but it's moving the data from disk or across to other systems, from pulling it into our processors. So if we can reduce that data and also minimize the movement, I think we're going to achieve better um, ability to have energy efficient systems. Aptly stated. So anyone that has used cloud is very familiar that it's not actually a computational cost that's really expensive. It's the movement of the data that costs you an arm and a leg. Um, sure. Yeah, well, well said. Now, focusing on a bit more about the small data size, right? When we're talking about high performance computing, in my mind, I always think about really large, massive data sets, right? Because that's really where the value comes in, because it can crunch these numbers in much more uh, reasonable time that's useful in terms of making decisions at point of action. Now, if we shift a bit and we're talking about small data or smaller size data, how does this really impact that ROI that you gain from using HPC in terms of computation? So to do that data reduction, first of all, we may need large systems that are able to do that data reduction. So I first have to load the data to figure out how do I manipulate it and how do I reduce it? So I may create a big data set that's got everything, but then very quickly figure out how do I extract out the, the core features that I need to then use in other types of analyses. So I don't think um, that we're going to get rid of all data. Much of it is junk that certainly we're going to throw away, but we're still going to have lots of data sets that we want to inspect or inquire and also, also, we're now putting together or joining data sets, and that requires bigger systems to be able to explore what's in them or the power of doing that to solve the questions on hand. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And speaking of that, so if we're talking about data reduction, um, in my mind, I go right back to dimension reduction. Right? This is something back in the 2000s that was a very big deal in, in the research community. Right. I spent a lot of time doing dimension reductions of data. Now, is there a change in terms of the technology in terms, uh, or the methodology, really, in terms of how we reduce data? Are we going back to more of a, a tensor, low rank decomposition, sort of matrix extraction methodology um, to reduce the dimension of the data? So that, that's a very interesting question. Those data, um, the dimensionality reduction often deals with high dimensional data, um, often more dense data sets. I think we're going to find new techniques in addition to that. For instance, we have data that is um, maybe much harder to describe in, in those terms. And in many cases, we need to maintain the richness of, of the data. So let, let me give you an example. If you are a web provider and you're trying to serve up ads, 
you build a recommend recommender engine and maybe you're trying to decide between the five best ads to show the viewer of your website you can remove a lot of data because at the end of the, the day if you make a mistake because your data is more limited and you show a person ad b instead of ad a no one's going to know or if you're google ranking websites and the website at position 32 and 33 are swamped, no, nobody's going to care. But if instead you're trying to understand the next potential catastrophe that's going to happen, or you're trying to track a storm because for every mile of coastline where it hits, there's a million dollars that has to be spent on evacuation, there the details matter. So I sometimes talk about this in terms of the um, smooth, like these recommender systems where errors really don't matter that much to the rough, which is really the end of these long tails of our data distribution where individuals matter. For instance, on a cyber attack, one single edge representing a packet could be my tell that there's an adversary technique attacking my network. So I don't want to throw away what's typically noise because that may be where my information sits. Sure, that makes sense, absolutely. Um, another question. So we're talking about uh, open source and democratization of HPC and N NVIDIA's open source library, right? To make that put basically high performance computing in the hands of everyday users. What would be a use case? Now imagine I have an, I'm an organization, maybe a small, medium sized businesses. Um, all I, maybe I have, I'm like sophisticated enough where I have large or maybe small amounts of data, but I have enough data that can do some work with it by sitting on a single server or, or, or across a couple of servers. What's a couple of use cases I can leverage uh, the open source NVIDIA library to actually do some high perform performance computing that will affect my IRI? So th that's a, a great question. And every company has to understand their customer base they also have to understand their internal organization and they also have to understand for instance insider threats mm -hmm. so for instance in some of those cases knowing my customers better what do my customers want is going to be very helpful to me as as a company so any type of analysis that i can have from that input in the second case understanding how my company operates for instance i may have salespeople in my company and one is just doing great compared to the others. I may want to understand best practices and under, understand, for instance, what information does the salesperson read? How is, how are they informed? How do they make their decisions? And that's going to be very helpful. Or I may want to understand the operating mechanisms within the company and maybe find operational efficiencies that will help me compete compared to my competitor companies that have already figured it out. Now, it, it's very interesting to miniaturize this data science using, for instance, the NVIDIA GPUs. A number of years ago, I, I looked at miniaturizing this framework, Stinger, that ran on a big supercomputer. We got it running on a Raspberry Pi with about 256 kilobytes of memory. Oh. So that, that's small, and really that amount of memory measured the amount of time that we could store. So on a big supercomputer, you could store 10 years of data, for instance, in terabytes of, of RAM. But on that little Raspberry Pi, an embedded system doing this type of open source graph analysis, we could store, say, three minutes. And it was interesting. We, we worked with a fashion technology designer, Anouk Wiprak, and looked at the capabilities of fashion technology and embedded technology with parallel processing and robotics and other types of, of features to understand, um, for instance, who you're interacting with and who are the people that are surrounding you if you're in a, a crowd, for instance. So there, there's some very interesting uses as we miniaturize in places we haven't even thought of, like fashion technology. And do you find that it makes a difference in this sort of miniaturized situation uh, using um, um, a GPU versus not? 
So sure, there are many problems where time is important. So while we could run things on a Raspberry Pi and it was very cheap, $25, it was very, very slow. And so if my response time is on the order of minutes, that, that's great. But if I'm walking down the street and I want to understand my situation, like there's a car about to hit me, or there's a bicycle over here, or the person coming towards me is a threat, I don't want to wait minutes because I may not have minutes. And so the ability to accelerate in many problems is going to be really a critical difference. And so you have to look at the, um, the, the time that you have for running the analytics that you need to run and then invest in the right technology that can meet that quality of service. Right. So basically insight at point of decision. That, that's right. right. All right. Um, to wrap things up, I think we have one final question. And I feel uh, we cannot end this session but look, without looking forward. And where do you see high performance computing or analytics computing 10, five years from now? Where do you see that going? New directions? How is that evolving? So that's a great question. And we see a convergence of data science and traditional high performance computing coming together. And what I mean by that is it used to be that the traditional high performance computers could solve weathers like designing a better jet or understanding climate and weather prediction. And data scientists would try to understand objects or make recommendation engines or do machine learning, et cetera. Those technologies are converging now. And it's a very exciting period because we expect by 2023 to have these incredible exascale supercomputers that can do both that traditional supercomputing, but also can do these types of data science problems. With machine learning, we already see many companies doing architectures for learning. Cerebras, uh, among others, have now wafer scale technology with billions of transistors working together on the same wafer. This is, um, in fact, trillions of transistors. This is actually um, game changing. And as we go forward, what I expect is that we're going to find our designs running faster and faster with less energy due to these new custom processors. Already, Google uses TPUs um, and many companies that know what they're running have their own custom ASICs or processors. And I think for data science, we're going to see new capabilities because we have these specialized accelerators or processors, if you will, that are able to better run our data science and make things that were impossible possible. So it's an exciting time. I think what you're doing, Betsy, with Data Yap is great to bring together this community. And I think it's, it's really a great time to start thinking about what could we do with that new capability a few years from now. Oh, thank you, David. That was fantastic. I had a blast. Uh, we were certainly, I think I want to keep uh, talking to you and we'll, we'll probably continue our conversation at some later point. I want to talk more <laughs> details around the technical things that are going on. But thank you again for uh, agreeing to give this presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure the audience are going to have a blast as well. Um, I think we're about time. And so I want to thank you all. And our next session is going to start at 5 o'clock or 5.15, I think. Yes. <laughs> all right, guys. I will see you later. Bye. Thank you.